one more um, uh, call out to Yamish, who just won the uh, International Women's Media Foundation Grand Eiffel Award and the uh, NABJ Journalist of the Year. So now, uh, Yamish, do you want to say something about your awards? Uh, they are, I feel very, very blessed to have these awards. Um, they're about, they're focused on my work this year and last year um, dealing with the coronavirus and, and the White House. So I'm excited to, to, to be awarded. I'm also in the midst of still doing the work. So it's great to know that my peers um, have recognized my work. And I'm so excited to be here at NYU because I wouldn't be where I am without Marsha and Jason and Joe and so many others. So even though I looked scrambled getting here, I was like, I have to get here because I know how much <laughs> NYU is important. So I am completely ignoring if Joe Biden comes out to talk because I'd rather talk to you all. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Governors are requesting they don't actually need. You said New York might need I, that I might not need thirty thousand. You said it on I Sean Hannity's on, Fox News. You said you know that why, you don't, might, why don't you some, people act? Let, let me ask you. You said why some don't state, you act? Why don't you act in a little more positive? It's always trying to my get question you, to you. Get is, you, get you, and you know what? That's why nobody trusts the media anymore. My That's question why to you people, is, how is that going to impact? Me, you didn't hear me. That's why you used to work for the Times, and now you work for somebody else. Look, let me tell you something. Be nice. Don't Mr. President, my question Don't is... Don't be threatening. Um, Yamish, how, um, what's it been like to be confrontational with the President of the United States? Doing a very good job at it, by the way. Thank you. Um, it's been a bit surreal and it's been a bit um, challenging because I think the President has wanted to mislead this country a lot about the pandemic and about the virus. When I watch those exchanges, it's me really, really trying to press for information that I know Americans all over this country sitting around their living rooms want to know, um, especially at the beginning of this when testing was so hard and we saw cities like New York um, engulfed in, in the virus. Um, so I, I think for me, I've really felt proud of my work because I think in the middle of a pandemic, the, the role of the press has to be to hold politicians and leaders like President Trump accountable. Um, and I've done that, I think, at, at, at my very best. I've tried my very best to also remain professional and poised and not let it get personal. Um, because at the end of the day, I think that the people who watch PBS, who watch me on MSNBC, or, or who are watching any organization, any news organization, what they're looking for are answers to their suffering. This was the biggest story that NYU journalism has had to cover. It was the biggest story that any of us have covered and hopefully the biggest story that we will ever cover. And uh, immediately after the attacks, it was obvious that considering NYU is so close to the World Trade Centers, was so close to the World Trade Centers, that we needed to do something about it. And though journalists are meant to dissociate themselves from the story, it was very hard for all of us because we were part of the story. That was a little <laughs> surprise for you. <laughs> um, yeah, I As you say, recall, I mean, you had had yeah. You'd had one class before we um, went and covered 9-11, I think, maybe two. Yeah, I think we had two. And then 9-11 um, uh, happened and the university closed. Um, many of us who were in the program uh, immediately started freelancing for international broadcasters and you know, filing our own reports, uh, as well as doing it for NYU. Our David McKenzie, who has done so much reporting on this, is live in Botswana with more. We do want to warn you, some of the images you are about to see are quite graphic. And David, we can see the elephants behind you. That's right, John. What an extraordinary experience and pri privilege to be here in Botswana. Here near Kasani, you see that group of elephants behind me, some babies frolicking in the mud there. This is their daytime drink. Uh, they'll have several every day here by the river. Many herds behind me as far as our eyes can see. And the problem is now this debate is raging and these elephants could be under threat. Hello. Oh. Tuli's mother was killed. Panda was caught in the fence line of a commercial farm. Mulelo separated from the herd by a man-made fire. In Botswana, conservation success 
is increasingly coming at a cost. With COVID especially, the, the perception was, and I know that uh, Melinda Gates did an interview, in fact, with CNN, where she sort of alluded to there might be bodies on the streets across Africa. The perception was that it would be a disaster on the continent. And that also feeds into, unfortunately, some of the stereotypes people might have about various continent, uh, countries on the continent. And when it sort of proved that that wasn't really the case, I mean, I think it was important to bring some of that um, of what we learned at NYU to take things not at just face value uh, and to bring that, I want to say documentary way of looking at things, uh, because I do know that, that there is a tendency to simplify things to such a degree with television hard news that um, it becomes almost um, a caricature. And uh, one example was when we were in Cape Town right at the height of the virus and we went to see how they were dealing with it. And you could see that the, the experience with battling HIV AIDS on the continent and the, 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 when the virus hit here and the level of expertise of African scientists was painting a very different picture. So I think it, it, it is always important, I feel, to in the position we're in here covering the continent for often an American audience is to not fall in the traps of those stereotypes. And I think NYU with its approach to storytelling and it's kind of a quirky take on things uh, for want of a better phrase, um, rather than kind of the, the first thing you see has been very helpful for my career, I think. I grew up in Egypt and I've been reporting on the Middle East for the past decade. Over and over, I've seen promises of reform that never led to any real change. It's left me wondering if change is impossible here or if progress is just so slow that it's hard to see. Mona just got back to take on the role of a uh, New York Times Cairo correspondent. And uh, just as she was settling in, she covered the big uh, explosion in Lebanon. Do you want to start there? Explosion happened in Beirut, so I took off and went there and it was actually one of the first, it was the first time that I was reporting in Lebanon. I, I was based in the region before. Um, it was quite the landing for me, <laughs> like in Egypt and off to Beirut. And I think it was kind of obviously a very tragic event, but for me, it was a great way to get started, you know, just land right in the middle of a big news event and um, hit the ground running. So, so back to sort of the question that you were asking or someone had asked you, Mish, and or this question about uh, truth and the inability to sort of shape and the message or control the message or have a unified or like here is kind of what happened, a single narrative or like an authoritative narrative um, is, is a challenge for sure. Um, and we see how that is playing out in the US. On the other hand, in a place like Egypt where the um, State has a very tight grip, tight, you know, has tightened its control over traditional like media, like television and, um, um, you know, the, the, the social media where it's much harder to, you know, control obviously and, and fact check every single thing that people post is the space though where there is more disruption, where there is an alternative voice, where people can express and can kind of say things that they are otherwise barred from saying and expressing. So 